Who do you love? Who deserves your loyalty? And are the two one and the same? One young, brilliant, beautiful FBI officer is tasked with betraying her heart and devotion to her country. Her mission will take her from the high rises of New York to the roads of West Africa to the island of her motherland. Will she have what it takes when the time comes to pull the trigger? Or will she find herself on the wrong side of the gun? Our spy is Marie Mitchell. The book is American Spy by Lauren Wilkinson. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit! Hey, y'all. Hey, this is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a podcast about books and drama. Alexis, how are you today? Mm, I'm doing all right. I saw the doctor today. Oh, so we're talking sorry. about healing is underway. If I cough <laughs> a little bit, it's just a little bit. You're still getting over COVID, kind of. Yep, yep. That lingering yep, yep. cough from COVID. Well, it's good to mm-hmm. see you. You yeah, look great. Girl, it's good to see you. Oh, you like the bonnet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad this isn't a video episode this week. Everyone can see your beautiful pink bonnet. <laughs> you know what? Let's continue. Yes, uh, please. <laughs> all right, y'all. Let's go on to the theme of the week. Each week, readers, if you're a regular listener of this show or a short time listener, you know that we choose a theme to discuss inspired by the book we're reading. Mm-hmm. And this week, I chose the theme, The Truth About Mary Bowser. Do you know who Mary mm. Bowser is? Man, it's sounding like I should know. I'm interested to know. <laughs> yeah, you actually do know. This is one of those names that um, pop up occasionally when the topic of spies come up. Mm. Um, oftentimes when people talk about Harriet Tubman and her um, efforts to uh, help the union win, they'll talk about Mary Bowser. Well, Mary is an often misunderstood historical figure. She's likely born a slave in Virginia, educated by the family who enslaved her. And then she used her resources to smuggle secrets as a spy for the Union during the Civil War. That we know. But what does history often get wrong about Mary? Let's play a game! (laughs) And when we're like uh, low energy like this... I think games are great, especially when Alexis is the one on the spot. Pew, pew. Finger guns. Listen, I had a friend say you should not be doing me like that. Ah. So let's going to get you. Let's play American Spy or American Lie. Alexis, I'm going to tell you three things. This is basically a. Two lies and the truth or whatever. Okay. So spot uh-huh. the lie for a chance to win a million dollars. <gasps> I'm going <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> I'm a high one truth in a series of lies, including often repeated lies about Mary, who she was and what she did to save the union during the Civil War. Like people Ooh. often get her wrong. Credible sources often get her wrong. So I'm going to sprinkle in some of those uh, untruths. In this uh, series, so spot the truth. Can I ask you where you got round. your truth from that you know is the truth and yeah. not a lie? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because as I was, um, so I have sources, right? So um, uh-huh. there's a autobiography about her with uh, from a historian uh, that did a lot more research than um, some one-off articles about Mary, and then there's okay. also an article in Time Magazine I found very edifying. Um, And even like Wikipedia had a list of lies about her that were interesting because as I was reading articles about her, I found some of those lies printed as fact and they were illogical. Like, for example, and this isn't included in the game, but um, I think of the family that um, enslaved her. One of the descendants was saying that she accidentally threw uh, Mary's diary away and that it included a lot of the secrets um, that she was smuggling to the north. But it's very unlikely that a spy would be writing down all the secrets and keeping them in a diary. You know what I mean? (laughs) For for what? Now, what what spy do you know in a movie (laughs) wrote down a secret? I mean, any movie. Today, the Confederacy (laughs) planned a battle. It won't go well. 
<laughs> yeah. So people later was like, that didn't happen. No, obviously it didn't. So okay. anyway, so th- but these are a little more subtle. So I hope you spot the truth. Let's start. Round one. Name that Mary. Are you ready, Alexis? <laughs> no, but go ahead. Number one. Mary's real name was Mary Blige, and it is from her, the singer of the same name, borrowed her moniker. Ooh. Two. Mary's real name was Mary Jane Richards Denman, and she was only married to a man with the last name Bowser for a short time. Three. Mary's real name is Mary Bowser, as is often stated, and she took the last name of her slave owner because he was secretly her father. Ooh. Spot the truth. Spot the truth. Two lies and the truth. Um, I'm going to go with what was the second one? Mary's real name was Mary Jane Richard Stenman, and she was only married to a man with the last name Bowser for a short time. Dang, this is hard, especially when you don't know what you don't know. And then you you do know, but you might have been taught wrong. Okay, I'm going to go with three, three, three. Number three, Mary's real name is Mary Bowser, as is often stated. She took the last name of the, her slave owner because he was secretly her father. Uh, you wrong. Mm, so oh, it was, it was I one. I, got... I was thinking one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, but you, you, um, your instinct was kind of pulling you to the second, right? Yes. But you ignored it. You ignored it. Mm -hmm. Well, number two is the truth. Mary's real name is Mary Jane Richards Denman. She's only married to a man with the last name Bowser for a short time. This is a truth that is actually widely available. However, a descendant of the family that um, enslaved her, uh, the niece was like, I think her last name was Bowser. And so it was printed as Bowser and people often repeated it as Bowser that's what they had believed okay all right yeah so from here on out we're actually gonna call her Mary Jane Richards Denman because that's a name wow you got me with this one for real (laughs) round two what she did okay you ready for the three two two lies and the truth here we go number one When Mary Richards was very young, the family that enslaved her expatriated her to Liberia, believing she nor any black people had a place in this country. Number two, when Mary Richards was very young, she stowed away on a boat headed to Liberia in search of freedom. Number three, when Mary Richards was very young, she met Lewis and Clark and used their entourage to escape to Canada. I became Sean Connery for a second. I don't know why. <laughs> and what is that based on exactly? How did you get there? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delirious with exhaustion. So what it is, Alexis? What's, I'm going to go with truth? number two. Two. Number two, when Mary Richards was very young, she stowed away on a boat headed to Liberia in search of freedom. Sorry, Alexis. The truth was number one. Oh, good grief. I said, you was not going to get this million dollars. Number one, when Mary Richards was very young, the family that enslaved her expatriated her to Liberia. Perhaps they were thought. You know, they were doing her a favor because no black people had a place in America. You know, you always put me in these games where the prize is hard to win. (laughs) Why? Here we go. (laughs) You ready? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Two lies and a truth. Number one, Mary was married multiple times, including to a white man named John Denman. Number two. Mary never remarried after her first husband and was rumored to hate men due to her cruel upbringing. Number three, Mary was once married to two men simultaneously. When the gentlemen found out about each other, they dueled at dawn, resulting in the death of one man named John Denman. <laughs> Dude, these are wild. They're really they good, right? True. I'm patting myself on the back. One yeah. of them is the truth. One but they are pretty juicy. Juicy. 
You know, that kind of stuff be in the street. I know. Where is Mona Scott? Oh, she wasn't alive yet. <laughs> I'm going to go with number one. Number one, Mary was married multiple times, including to a white man named John Denman. Wow. Wow. Finally, Alexis, it is your turn to collect the cash. <laughs> you are correct. Mary was uh, married to John Denman in Georgia, which had some of the harshest laws uh, when it came to interracial marriage. Continuing, we got two more uh, series of questions for you. Here we go. Number one, Mary converted to Quakerism and was smuggled to safety in Philadelphia in a cartload of manure during the Civil War. Number two. Mary chose to live in the South to fight for the Union during the Civil War and smuggled secrets from the home of the Confederates' only president. Number three, Mary had a photographic memory and used her skill to free herself and other slaves. Which is the truth? Mary had a photographic memory and used it to free herself and other slaves. Huh. Ooh. Ye. Ha. You should know your history. This is February. Oh, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> uh, you said I have been deceived all my life. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, I'm going to go with what was number two? <laughs> Mary chose to live in the South to fight for the Union during the Civil War and smuggled secrets from the home of the Confederacy's only president. That. I guess it's possible. I'm going to go with three. Oh, you were so close. <laughs> How is she going to use a photographic memory to free slaves? Now you explain <laughs> that to me. That's, that's what I was, that was my first thing. I was like, what would she use a photographic memory? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe well, a alas, number two know. is the truth. <laughs> she, of course, chose to stay in the South. That's how she became a spy for what would become the Union, which became the United States of America. Mm-hmm. That and was, the Confederates, that was it. The Confederate, I knew that. I knew it. <laughs> the Confederate States only uh, had one pseudo president and she like snuck in like she was cleaning. This is the truth. And was like, mm, let me move these papers I can't read. And then she was reading them <laughs> and, and writing down what they said and smuggling them up to the north. But it's interesting. These two lies are often spoken of as truth that she became a Quaker and was put in a truck of poop and smuggled to Philadelphia. That's that is a lie. And also that she had a photographic memory. I mean, I made up that part about her freeing slaves with it. I don't know how that would happen, but when you I'm figure it out, think. you tell me. Maybe there was a map she was taking a picture of For and real? she followed it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that connect. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> and lastly, our final Man, round, on, Misha, how she on. ended. Ooh, ooh cut that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Number one, like other union spies, Mary was paid handsomely for her efforts after the war ended and her memorial was erected in Washington, D.C. in 1989. Mm. Number two, Mary was later never compensated by the union and never found financial freedom as a black woman post-Civil War. Number three, Mary died rich in Canada. Oh, no. Listen, Mary, Mary. (laughs) Um. Hmm. Okay, okay. Um, She died rich in Canada or she was never paid. Or she was paid handsomely and a memorial was erected in D.C. in 1989. That seemed too shocking to believe. It could be the truth. But I'm going to go with two again. Hey! (laughs) Yay! Let's celebrate because, of course, Mary was never compensated. You know, she never found financial freedom. It was hard. Her life was a struggle. Yada, yada. Of course, of course. Mm-hmm. And that's how her uh, her uh, role ended as 
the American spy. Oh, I who love people it. People don't oh, even I bother knowing it. her name. Yeah. I love Mary that. Jane Richards Denman. You ready to take a break? And then we'll go yeah. on to our novel, American Spy. Okay, great. Here we go. Okay. Bye. Do you have yes. any information for us on Lauren Wilkinson and perhaps her inspiration for American Spy, the novel? You know, I didn't find a lot of information about her. And I was looking for stuff and it was just like real short. So I'm going to keep it short. She was she's an American writer who splits her time between New York and Los Angeles. She has a, a master in fine arts and fiction and literary translation from Columbia University. She's taught writing at Columbia and the Fashion Institute of Technology. She was a Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellow and has received support from both the McDowell Colony and Jurassic Resident Artist Program. Her writing has appeared in Granta, The Believer, New York Magazine, and The New York Times. The American Spy is Lauren's debut novel and was published in February 2019 in the U.S. and then in July 2019 in the U.K. It was a Washington Post bestseller and NAACP Image Award, Award nominee and an Anthony Award nominee and an Edgar Award nom- nominee. It was a Barnes and Noble Book of the Month, a PBS book club pick, and was included in Barack Obama's 2019 recommended reading list. That's where I first uh, found this book, actually, was in Barry's list. Oh, so. <laughs> Barry, is that your friend? Is that, mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. I love that. And she's gorgeous, too. Her photo is on mm-hmm. the um, cover of my book on that back cover. So um, can you please, before we dive into the book with plot spoilers, give us a brief synopsis without spoilers of American Spy. A mother writes the story of her life as a spy to her young twin sons as she maps out a plan to find the man who is trying to kill her. Kari, who do you think would enjoy reading this book? If you're looking for a James Bond-esque novel, some type of um, spy thriller that's more mm, about the emotional integrity of the protagonist and without all the problematic like hidden women and stuff, then I think you may be interested in American Spy. And Alexis, what were your first thoughts of American Spy? Well, I was like, saw the cover. I think this popped through as a recommendation while I was waiting for another book. I think the book was called Falling. And so I was like, ooh, Spy, yay. (laughs) Um, So I jumped on it. It seemed interesting. All right. I love it. Well, let's begin. The time has come for a deep dive into American Spy by Lauren Wilkinson. Please, Alexis, take it away. There will be spoilers. Part one, The Intruder. Picture it. Connecticut, 1992. The sound of the house settling turns out to be a midnight intruder. The narrator grabs the gun as a man appears in her room. There is biting, screaming, choking, clawing, and finally, a gunshot. Woo! And a man is dead. The narrator quickly evaluates the scene. The phone ring. It's the neighbor checking to see if everything is all right. And then the sound of sirens. The neighbor called the police. When the police arrive, they call out, Marie Mitchell, before kicking the door down. Three cops appear with their guns drawn. Marie puts her hands in the air and is told by the cops to put the weapon down. She complies. Children screaming in the background. Marie is passive and compliant as the police pat her down. She tells them the man is in the bedroom, dead. She doesn't know who he is. She tells them her father was a cop and that his shield is in her purse, but the police don't care. When the ambulance arrives, they tell Marie 
she needs stitches. Marie says that she will go to the hospital after she speaks to the police. Marie decides to take the children to the neighbor's house and then return to answer the questions for the police. As she responds to questions, she's concerned her eagerness to be truthful would make the police think she's lying. So her father was a career cop, so she's kind of nervous about authority. Finally, after speaking with the police, she goes to the hospital to be stitched up. She then returns to pick up her children, William and Tommy. Now, we don't be talking about William and Tommy at all, so. Forget they go. exist. <laughs> Yeah, even though the book is for them, forget them. Two days later, the family is in Martinique. After having used fake passports prepared for her by her father's friend, Mr. Ali, a few years earlier, Marie, with the new name Monica Williams, is in Martinique, heading to her mother's home. The children were young, so they didn't even notice that she got a new name. I said, kids do not care about your life. Oh, mama's Brittany now. Whatever. (laughs) Is the food ready? Yeah, yeah. They don't care. (laughs) She felt being at her mother's house would have been an advantage because of the way the house was situated. It's kind of situated high up and there's only one route in. They go to bed. Marie sleeps for the next 12 hours and the grandmother engages the children. When she awakes, she thinks about it and she knows that she's always told the children that their father died when his plane was shot down in the war. He was an American soldier and his family wanted nothing to do with them. But as the children are in bed that evening, we learn this story, that this story told through a series of flashback will be Marie writing a letter to her children telling their story, including an explanation of who their father was, why their father died and what he meant to Marie. Marie will even tell them who sent the man to their house and why. She wants them to have an honest record of their story in case she is not around to tell them. Part two, flashback to New York, 1987 the CIA. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the difference between the CIA and the FBI as far as their functionality in this country? No. (laughs) I mean, you could say any of the alphabet boys and I say, yes, they are all officers. But I know the F the um, CIA is higher. OK, that's what I'm thinking. Like the FBI is more U.S. policing the U.S., not policing, but whatever. And CIA is more like anywhere in the world for American interests. Yeah. Central intelligence. Part two. Flashback to New York, 1987. The FBI. Marie was a special agent with the FBI from 1983 to 1987. And during her time there, the CIA hired her twice as a temporary contractor which was the phrase given to spies. And it was during that time that she met the children's father. She started at the New York office in 1985, which was the year of the spy. That year, eight major spy arrests were made public. It was all over the news. People were concerned about spies living among them. Everybody was getting ratted out. One of the spies caught was a black woman, and it was the first time an American had been caught spying for an African intelligence outlet. To Marie, it suggested a deeper scope to the CIA's operations in Central, excuse me, in West Africa. The agent leaked the names of more than a dozen CIA employees and informants to her boyfriend, who was a Ghanaian intelligence officer. The boyfriend was also related to the head of state who believed the CIA was trying to orchestrate a coup in the country. Marie hated her boss. Her boss was referred to as the assistant special agent in charge or ASAC. Um, During her first division meeting with her boss, he interrupted the brief. He interrupted the briefing to ask her to run to the kitchen and get him a cup of coffee in front of everybody. Like and then the most important part of this. Hey, Marie, go get me a cup of coffee. We'll hold. We'll wait for you. Yeah, everybody was was laughing. Like, why? Yeah. Yeah. This behavior set a bad precedent for her colleagues to mistreat her. They would exclude her from operational meetings because of, quote, 
Men were better at that kind of planning and agents didn't feel safe with her backing them up. Unquote. End quote. (laughs) She had to fight her way into surveillance operations. Most of the work she ended up doing was recruiting informants, which required lots of paperwork. Marie felt the boss was stalling her career. Marie felt like transferring out of New York would have made it seem like he won and she was too competitive for that. So she figured she'd bide her time and outsmart him. Yeah, but she's really bored in this role. Like she um, joined the uh, agency to be this like, top action FBI agent. She has the ability and she's just the butt of jokes. And yeah, Yeah. she's not seeing any action. In her time with the New York office, Marie recruited a respectable number of informants. In fact, she recruited more than anybody else. She also recruited hip pockets or guys who had no administrative file, but touch base what well, she touched base with occasionally. She believes that she had the only woman informant developed by any agent in the division. And the woman was her favorite informant. She was a member of the Patrice Lumumba coalition. The woman's uncle had once been a black Panther and associated with the black liberation army, which was a violent underground offshoot of the Panthers. Today, she was meeting with her to terminate the relationship. And the woman was 20 minutes late for their regular meeting. Yeah, but she got her to be an informant because her um, boyfriend, right? The informant's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. What, what's the deal there? She's he's like incarcerated. And yeah. She wants and he to make beat sure, up somebody or something. Yeah. She wants to make sure he's not held any longer. And so this is like a negotiation. Like, I'll tell you secrets I know about this group. If you can hopefully bring home my child's father and the man I love a little sooner, or at least make sure while he's away in prison, he's not being tortured. Well, it's pretty more, dark. He didn't, so he didn't get more time for his the trouble he was causing in prison. Mm-hmm. We see whose side you on. The man. <laughs> She was paid $350 in cash by monthly to be an informant. I was like, I could do that. Could I tell her? <laughs> Who can I inform on? Oh, that's Alexis talking, <laughs> not me. Me? Marie felt like developing um, informants was a waste of her time. She wanted to move up in her career, so she got rid of the informant. She was like, I don't need you. This is, I'm moving up. Forget you. She wanted some high profile operations. But she ended up firing her without her boss's permission, which was against the bureau, the bureau's policy. And she falsely signed her boss's name on like this termination paper or whatever the paperwork was Mm -hmm. uh, for the informant. So there's some deception there, too. Basically, she's like, if you're going to make me, um, you know, squander my time in this role, even though I like this informant, I'm going to do what I got to do to get out of this situation and start seeing some real action as an agent. Right. Part three, flashback to New York, 1962, to be a spy. Marie's mother lived in Martinique until Marie's grandmother died. After living with her sister for a short while, her father wanted her to move to New York to live with her sister, his sister, her aunt. Her aunt in turn forced Marie's mom to live as a white girl. So in a way, I think Marie saw this as her mother being a spy herself because she moved between the black and white worlds. Her mother lived her life in New York, passing as a white person until she married her father. Marie's parents argued throughout their relationship and her mother ended up leaving the family, leaving Marie and her sister behind and returned to Martinique while the girls was the girls were still young. One thing Marie remembers about her mom before she left was that what she said about Marie's father. A man is a reflection of the company he keeps. Look at your father's friends. They're snitches, all of them. And although Marie didn't really understand what snitches meant, her sister, Elaine, repeated the word dreamily. Like, she was like, hmm, I could snitch. A snitch. Hmm. <laughs> While Marie knew she never wanted to be a snitch, she knew she didn't want to be a snitch. It took a long time for her relationship with her mother to recover, but it eventually did. 
Mr. Ali was the first person Marie knew to be undercover. Marie and her sister Elaine were watching TV one evening, which showed footage from Malcolm X's funeral. Their father told them to look out for him because he would be one of the cops present for crowd control. He was the only black cop in his precinct and black officers were requested for crowd control. As they watched TV, they saw Mr. Ali step up to the podium and the words across the screen displayed a name they'd never heard before. And he was introduced as the Nation of Islam's secretary. Okay. After the next story started, Lane was like, I'm going to be a spy too. Confused, Marie asked, he's a spy? Elaine said, what else would he be on TV with a fake name and a fake <laughs> job? You know he works for the FBI. The idea of being a spy kind of floored Marie, but Elaine, having spoken the words, made them possible, not just for Elaine, but for Marie. And it made her excited to strike out into the world um, and she could do that with her sister. I think this is the time period where they talked about opening the agency or something, or maybe that was later on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Her sister wanted to open a private like spy agency. Yeah. Which I didn't even. I too. was like, do people do that? But of course they do. <laughs> even yeah. overseas, America contracts companies like this. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. 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 Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about her sister. Her sister was curious and courageous. She shot and cut up a deer on her 13th birthday with her father. Meanwhile, Marie was like sick. She was like, Ugh, how could you do that? But she also was a bit jealous as it appeared that Elaine was her father's and her mother's favorite. Maria also recalls a time when she and her sister went swimming at the local pool. And this there was a girl um, there who often picked on Marie and then she dunked her underwater for uh, about three times. Just the laughing. Girl, the bully did. Yeah. yeah. The bully dumped the, dunked the little sister Marie underwater almost killing her and laughing, having a good time about Have, it. Yeah, yeah. And her sister comes to her rescue and pushes the bully's head underwater. And it kept her under there until the lifeguard blew the whistle. When the bully climbed out of the water, Elaine yanked her ankle so that she fell. And then she was about to punch her, but then the counselor stopped her. Then within a year, Elaine and the bully became best friends. And her mm -hmm. sister was like, wait, what? Yeah, so um, Elaine, the older sister, after the bully does this to her younger sister, befriends the bully. And the bully's hanging out at the house, spending the night like they are best friends. Best friends. The bully was sleeping over. One night when the bully spent the night, uh, Elaine sent Marie to the store. And when Marie returned from the store, she saw her sister beating up the girl. Brutally. And Marie, yeah. And out Marie, of nowhere. Out of mm -hmm. nowhere. And Marie yelled for her to stop, Elaine to stop. But she just kept punching the girl. And then suddenly she stopped and came over to Marie and was like, oh, girl, did you get the eggs? Did, and does any of them eggs broke? <laughs> they watched yeah, her she sister home. Mm -hmm. And the bully was left on the ground all curled up. And when she finally recovered, the bully, that is, she yelled that she was going to have Elaine jumped. She was like... Hmm, okay. We'll when see. Marie asked her um, what Why the bully did. Why you do that did, for her? I thought that was your friend. <laughs> yeah, she was like, really? Okay. Now, I was just practicing some, you know, spies have to be able to get close to people and then turn on them. After that, her father sent her sister away to Martinique to live with her mother. She came back six months later and... Marie felt like she was a different person, like she had changed, but she could tell there was still something under there that the original sister was there. Even like she was just putting on the front for the daddy. Her sister decided she wanted to enlist in the military. She wanted to be an intelligence officer. The next time she saw her sister was in North Carolina. Elaine took her to meet up with some of her friends at the bar it was a group of men and she was meeting up with um, these guys who were from the 82nd Airborne. So it sounds like a, um, well, whatever, from Air the Force. 82nd Airborne. Yeah. And when they were alone, Elaine suggested to Marie that she should consider intelligence. And she, and she, again, she talked about that together they could do this um, spy agency. agency thing together. Mm-hmm. 
One of the guys that they met up with was a white man named Daniel Slater, who had been recruited by the CIA once his contract with the army was up. This was her sister's boyfriend. (laughs) Far for New York, 1987, accepting the assignment. One day, Marie meets for lunch with Mr. Ali. Mr. Ali was one of a small handful of black special agents hired during J. Edgar Hoover's tenure at the Bureau. He was used almost exclusively to undermine civil rights activists. Mr. Ali tells Marie about a big case he told her boss that he wanted her to be a part of. They suspected a spy in the foreign mission office. Marie tells her boss tells him that her boss hasn't said anything to her about it. And, you know, he don't usually pick her for stuff. Mr. Ali tells Marie that her recruitment numbers are the highest in the agency. Um, They can't possibly keep ignoring you. But Marie says her numbers are the highest because that's all she has. She does. And her boss likes it because it makes him look good to the higher ups. So this is like a delicate scene where we see his devotion to the agency First and Mm -hmm. foremost, not even so much to his country, it seems like it's to the agency that he's given his life to. He's even willing to undermine civil rights groups on behalf of the agency, which works on behalf of the United States. And this is these are all based on like real events. And so he's telling her your chance will come, of course, because you do everything the agency wants. You do it better than anyone else. So your chance will come. And meanwhile, she's like. Yeah, mm-hmm. I grew up looking up to you, but you might be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is. She's like that. He, Because he's like, keep your head down, keep your toe to the line. Yep, just do whatever you know you're told and everything will work out. Yep. But Marie knew that Mr. Ali's career has stalled. And after Hoover died, he became political poison because of the illegal operations Hoover had him doing. So they gave him a quarter of a corner office and a few raises and kind of kept him quiet. And that's how he's been repaid for keeping his head down and following orders. This reminded me of our discussion about um, uh, respecting like your highest authority. And for Mm -hmm. him, his highest authority was whoever the boss was giving orders, but that boss could change and did. And so when it came to light that you were one of the tools that um, we used effectively to complete these illegal operations. We now feel ashamed of you and we have to hide you. So right. doing whatever he was told didn't benefit him. Yeah, that was that was yeah. really illustrated. And, and so Marie wasn't trying to listen to that advice about not rocking the boat. Marie felt like she needed to tip the boat so she could get notice. Marie asked Mr. Ali if he'd ever done anything out of bounds or against policy. And Mr. Ali seemed a bit defensive and said never. And he was like, I thought you knew me. But she felt like there was a little guilt in his response, but she wasn't going to pick at it. She then tells him she was asking, you know, just kind of calm the room a little bit that she was asking because she had an informant she wanted to dismiss, but she can't get her boss's approval. Hearing the question, Mr. Ali relaxed and he tells her, if your boss won't sign off of it, don't do it. Going behind your boss's back is trouble. Marie felt like she was wasting her time writing the reports. I think I mentioned this before when the group wasn't doing anything illegal. Why am I tracking this group and they're not doing illegal stuff? She felt like the political climate at the the bureau made her feel like um, she could come to an a sorry in if she wasn't strict about her ethics. So Marie won, um, didn't want to participate in spying on citizens who weren't doing anything illegal. In a certain sense, she felt like it was pretty simple. She was a servant of the law, but intelligence policies sometimes descended into a mark that was dividing the line between people engaging in legal political dissent and then those that were um well, and into illegal or posing a military threat to the government. And she wanted to make it clear if Mr. and Mr. Ali's um, position in his career made it feel like she had a choice. So follow the bureau's policy or uphold the law. And she wanted to uphold the law. When she returned from lunch with Mr. Ali, Marie had a memo from her boss 
of him wanting to meet with her. So she believes it's about the Patrice Lumumbo coalition. But it turns out the boss wanted to introduce her to someone from the CIA, Ed Ross. And the conversation wasn't about her informant. Instead, it was about Tomas Sankara, the president of what was formerly Upper Volta, which after a coup, he renamed Burkina Faso. Sankara was a young man who came into power when he was 33 years old. He was charismatic. He was an excellent speaker. He played guitar in a jazz band, and he rode around town on a motorcycle. (laughs) Ross told the two, um, her boss and Marie, that Sankara was coming to New York and would be speaking at a um, the Lumumba rally. The CIA wants Marie to keep Sankara under surveillance. Marie asked if there was something specific they're looking for. He said, Ross said, the CIA wants to know how much Sankara knows about the U.S.'s involvement in the ULCR, which is a political par- party that he formed in his government. Yeah, so the U.S. is trying to um, overthrow this char- charismatic man's um, like seat of power and implement their own party, which they they can then use as puppets to uh, do their bidding. Right. And, and so, that happens. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The CIA wants to push Sankara's government into a mar- multi-party system. Uh, and Marie's like, well, why would they do that? And he's like, well, we're trying to make their government similar to the French government, okay? Because that's what they're familiar with. And Marie is like, hmm, that don't make sense. Marie thought mm-hmm. she might be able to use... Um, her informant, that woman informant that she has for a one-time assignment, but they wanted mm-hmm. somebody who spoke French to get close to him and learn information. Marie didn't volunteer herself. Instead, her boss spoke up, which she thought, that's odd. Don't you speak French? Isn't your mother French or something like that? And she like, um, I don't Do like I? that. <laughs> she <laughs> yeah. said she wanted them to be more forthcoming about the assignment. So she offered somebody else, but this wasn't, they were offering her something that she's been wanting an opportunity to go undercover. This is something she was eager to participate in, but she felt like they were using her because she was black and they expected Sankara to find her attractive. Yeah. They were using her as a honeypot to seduce their target. And that's not what she wanted. Yeah. Marie felt like there were too many ways for this to backfire on her. So she recommended another agent who spoke um, French. Marie felt like Mr. Ali had let the um, bureau use him and it trapped him professionally. So she didn't want to get caught up in that. She um, the boss told her that she wasn't a team player and she wasn't going to get fired if she behaved in that manner. <laughs> She walks out the room, kind of leaves the building. And later that day, she finds the CIA agent, CIA agent is following her. And he invites her to dinner to convince her one more time to accept the assignment. Marie told him she can't work with somebody who's not honest with her. And he wasn't being honest. So he said he couldn't tell her everything in front of the boss. So come on to dinner and I'll give you the true story. Well, at dinner, Ross introduces Marie to his partner as an element of recruitment. Um, Is giving her an in, like, I can trust you with my story. So you can trust me and do this. But Marie is fully aware of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Ross told Marie that at the heart of SQLR, which is... um, kind of an offshoot of the CIA. I'll say that for now. Is wanting oh, I thought her... this was... Oh, go ahead. I thought this operation was SQLR. Yeah, that's what she thought too, is oh. wanting her <laughs> to get close to Sankara. She was offended because she's like, so you just want me to seduce this man? So mm-hmm. she got up to leave and as she headed toward the exit, Ross asked her if she knew somebody named Daniel Slater. Do y'all remember that name? Right. (laughs) That was her sister's boyfriend. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Ross told her that Daniel recommended her for the assignment. She like, um, okay. But at the moment she's thinking I could do that because I got some questions for him, but he felt like she would be successful at getting the intel. So she agreed to do the assignment, but she knew she wanted to get in touch with Daniel. So right now, of course, her sister's dead. 
Um, We know that. And so she wants Slater to give her some information, an inside look and who her sister was before she died. And so she's like, uh, if doing this operation will somehow get me more information on my sister, then maybe I'll consider it. Part five, New York, 1987, the assignment. I got two parts left. Marie's cover was that she was from the chief of protocols office. When she met Sankara, she was immediately impressed by his speech to the UN and taken in by his character. She learned Sankara wanted to see Harlem. So she offered to take him on a tour. He said, is the entire delegation invited or are you just inviting me? He was checking. Mm-hmm. He wasn't sure. So she said, mm-hmm. "You can, everybody could come. So the next day they meet at her home and they walk him to the Patrice the Mamba Coalition rally, and he's going to speak at the rally. That is Sankara. When they arrived at the rally, Marie immediately noticed her informant who looked the other direction. Sankara's speech was Very different <laughs> from the UN speech, and Marie and the crowd were captivated. She could feel his passion as he spoke. She felt like he was speaking directly to her. After the speech, they returned to Marie to her apartment. But Sankara still wanted that tour. So he took his bag and a change of clothes and his like security and other people that were with him left. And she was like, well, you could stay at my apartment and I could just cook for you. And he was like, nope, I can't be doing that. You ain't going to get me caught up. But Marie was attracted to Sankara. So she wasn't even sure how she meant it. She was in confusion herself. As Marie and Sakara walked and talked, they found they had many things in common and she was revealing more about herself than she actually intended. She learned his government had voted to ban that multi-party elections that the U.S. were trying to get started. And she didn't believe that he actually knew about the CIA's involvement. She also noticed that there was a surveillance van that seemed to be following her. And she was thinking they're trying to capture pictures of her and Sankara. Marie invited Sankara to her place for a nightcap. Of course, he declined, but he did kiss her on the cheek and he left. When she met with Ross the next day, uh, she reviewed what she learned. She was she drawn the conclusion that the CIA only wanted images of her and Sankara to blackmail him. She received the money for the assignment, which was hefty and uh, actually just half of it. And then asked to see Daniel Slater. And Ross was like, uh, he's not but here. you didn't do your job. Yeah. And she <laughs> yeah, like, was like, you mm-hmm. didn't finish the, a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> what are we supposed to do with that? Yeah, exactly. So she felt like he was punishing her because he didn't get what he wanted. So Marie was called into the office like the next couple of days or something by her boss and her boss's boss. And guess who's Yikes. sitting in the room? Mr. Ali. Her play uncle. Mm-hmm. 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 They accused her of falsifying reports. She, of course, was offended. She felt set up and left the room. Mr. Ali caught up with her at the elevator and tried to explain his side. She was like, whatever. Although she talked to him and she talked to her boss who was saying, you you need to be more approachable. You need to be a team player. They want to suspend her for 45 days. She ends up signing the suspension. And her boss said, you should have worked with the CIA. He don't know that she did work with the CIA. <laughs> She'd been suspended for a couple of weeks. And then Ross reaches out to her. And Marie is surprised. Ross tells uh, Marie Daniel Slater wanted to use Marie for an assignment with SQLR in Burkina Faso. Marie accepted the assignment. Ross lets Marie know that they do want photos of Sankara with her. Since most of his support is based on his reputation for being honorable, the CIA wanted to smear his image and reveal him as a hypocrite. Marie, again, accepted the position of being used by the CIA the assignment was only a couple of weeks and Marie knew she was given only what she wanted to give. Plus, she still wanted to meet Daniel Slater. So the U.S. is throwing flyers all in the streets in West Africa saying that this man is um, a nymphomaniac, insane. Mm-hmm. insane. Um, and then what they want is a photo of him with Marie to kind of prove everything they're saying. They're saying about him and that's their they're like club 
like, you know, um, people who market for clubs. Oh, <laughs> you, club promoters. Yes, they like promoters. club promoters. Yes. And the club is this party that they're trying to form to make a puppet out of this country. So like club promoters, you know, no one asked them to show up, but here they go throwing flyers in your window, <laughs> throwing flyers in your face, talking about your president is crazy. He mm-hmm. can't leave these women alone based on no merit. You know, does the club even exist? We yeah. don't know. It kind of do, but whatever. And so, yeah. So they want a photo of him and her and then they'll be like, then people will believe us. And the sad truth is maybe they will. Yeah. You can just lie on people and folks believe it. It's disgusting. Part six, Uwagadugu, 1980. Part six, Uwagadugu, 1987, meeting Daniel Slater. Marie arrived at her appointment to meet Daniel and Uwagadugu late and dirty. Daniel was busy and quickly gave her the assignment. Daniel gave her a camera radio and told her to leave it in her bedroom before Sankara arrives. Marie seems concerned about getting Sankara to her house, but Daniel tells Marie Sankara will invite himself to the wherever she's staying. Don't worry about it. It will happen. And this camera, it takes pictures every few seconds. So just leave it in the room and we'll get what we need. He mm-hmm. he received a call while he was meeting with her and he says, I got to go. But before leaving, he asked Marie to deliver these pamphlets that Kari talked about and then grab um, a package from his contact at this other place. So he sent in her own assignments right away. But that evening they had plans to meet for dinner. After several rink- drinks, Daniel tells Marie that he and her sister were married. She didn't know where this came from because she's like, I ain't never heard that before. What you talk about? He says they were driving back from California and they stopped off in Vegas and married. She couldn't believe that her sister didn't tell her that she was married, getting married and didn't invite her. And Daniel tells her that they were planning to have a reception in New York, but the accident happened and Elaine died a few hours after they wed. That's why she didn't know. Sure enough, Sankara invites himself to her place. It's about Mm -hmm. 4.30 in the morning and he arrived at her house. His security is with him and his security searches the house and he tells her that he knows that... um, what she is, and he knows he can't trust her. But at least she's beautiful, and they could spend time together. So he sat on the sofa, and he laid his head on her lap, and she invited him to the bedroom. And she goes, and she turns on the camera radio. They, he joins her in the bedroom. They sit on the bed, and he repeats that he knows who she is. And then he asks, what's her agenda? And Marie says she's working on a project for the embassy. And Tomas asks who in his government is working for them. And Marie says no one, but she really does know. He repeats the question and Marie repeats her response. They smooch a little for the camera radio. The next morning after Marie is getting out of the shower, she walks out of her bedroom and guess who in her room, girl? Guess Yes, girl. The um guy that recruited her. Daniel. Daniel is in the room. Now, mm-hmm. why is he in the room laying on her bed? He tells mm-hmm. her, listen, I heard uh, Sankara was there and he takes the film from the radio camera and he tells, she tells him, look, we was kissing, so it's plenty for the journalist to use. And Daniel seems confused why she would bring up journalists, but then says, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You think this is about blackmail. Yeah. You also think we the CIA, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, Daniel tell this uh, decides to tell Marie the whole story that he is working on another project in addition to the one she's helping with. She gets dressed, they hop in his car and leave, and Marie makes sure to take her gun because she doesn't trust da- uh, Daniel. As they drive along, Daniel tells Marie he did everything he could for her sister. She don't trust him. She like, wait, what? She hears that Daniel was in the car when her sister died, which is new information to her. And she's like shocked. He tells her that the car swerved off the road and hit a rock formation and his her sister wasn't wearing a seatbelt. 
He then takes Marie to this building where she sees a man imprisoned. And Daniel tells her this man is KGB. They know where to find him if they want him. To her, the man looks half dead. He then hands her a small package. All of it look illegal. Mm -hmm, with a syringe and a small vial of clear liquid. And she tells, he tells her that she is SQLR. And she's like, wait, what? <laughs> and she's like, listen, here's the situation. What we really need is an assassin and you fit the part. I've been keeping tabs with you on you over the years. I knew that I FBI wasn't using your skills and I wanted to fix that. We want to kill Sankara. And put his closest comrade in power. Listen, our organization, mm -hmm. the SQLR, is doing the work the CIA is not capable or doesn't have the backbone to do. When Marie gets back to her house, she calls her father and she... As she's calling him, she hears the line click, so she thinks it's tapped. She checks the phone for taps, believes it's clear, calls her father back and asks about Daniel. The father met Daniel, knew Daniel. He went down there to go look for the sister because at the time, the two sisters were fighting. So he wanted to check in with Elaine, the one that joined the military. And when he gets to the military, he learns that she's not there and they direct him that she's living with Daniel. So they go to, he goes to the house where the sister and Daniel are living. And he says, Hey daughter, let's go to lunch. And she turns around and asks Daniel and Daniel's like, no, you can't go. And then he's like, wait, what? Yeah. She's like, can I go with my father? And Daniel's like, nah. So she's like, sorry, dad. Bye bye. Yep. And they threw he, Daniel threw her father out. But then he showed up at the funeral all smiling on her face. So like Marie is like, you know what? Uh, this is I don't trust this man. Something is up with him. So she decides she's going to go see Sankara spill all the beans. He was going to Ghana for a speech and she was just going to join him there and tell him about everything that happened. She decided she couldn't save her sister, but she could protect Tomas or Sankara. And so she's also like, he's like fine and there's some tension between him. Mm -hmm. He's totally married, totally with a family, but she's allowed herself to basically fall in love with him. Yeah. And so she's like, great, this is my opportunity to do what my heart wants, which is be on his side. Yes. And so Marie decided that recruiter. Ross and Daniel worked together to manipulate her. They knew exactly what to do to get her to come and work with them. The phone rang as soon as she arrived in her room and it was Ross and he he said, listen, you're expendable. Your job is to take out Sankara. Ooh. You in a vulnerable spot. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to be dead. OK. All right. Then. When Marie saw Sankara, she meet, she told him everything she knew. She said, your closest friend is um, working with us. <laughs> listen, you you can't trust nobody. He was like, I already know that. He, she was like this happened and that happened he was like I already know that she then tells him about Daniel Slater and Thomas uh, excuse me Sankara already knew him and he's like well I know everything so you ain't really telling me nothing this is the way it works except that you in love with me mm -hmm. that's basically what you tell him yeah <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> she tells him Daniel is trying to kill him. He's like, I'm, I'm not afraid of death. Marie was frustrated because she felt like he was giving up and she left. Um, she realized she had risked her life for nothing. Tom um, Sankara came to her room. They had relations and he took her back to the house. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> to the house back in um Ouagadougou, where she grabbed up her belongings, prepared to leave town. But before she left town, she had something to do. And what was that, Kari? She had to. Oh, you want me to tell it? Tell it. She had to teach us how to jump a fence. Mm hmm. And go shoot Slater in the face while he in bed with his secretary. That's right. Wild. That's right. She went and she went to da uh, Slater, Daniel Slater's house, and she shot him. After she shot Daniel, she backed away. She got hit in the head because she was caught off guard, but she escaped a little bit. She escaped. She soon learned of Sankara's death. 
He did die. And um, and there was like a coup, a very dramatic one mm-hmm. where a lot of people lost their lives. Yep. So she escaped um, to Ghana, eventually went to Accra, then London, then finally Paris. And she quit the bureau, realizing she couldn't enforce their laws without questioning who they'd been a designed to serve six weeks later she found out she was pregnant and she finishes the story by telling her twins that she's going to find the man that's been trying to kill her and put him to death let's take a quick break all right let's do it Welcome back. So, Kari, what's your final verdict and would you recommend this book? So, I would like to stop on your final verdict. Um, I have heard you and other critics passively say, maybe, that you weren't thrilled with this plot line. It wasn't as tense, as intense as you wanted. And maybe in some parts you were bored. And to you, I say... What did you expect? (laughs) This is a good book. This is good. This is a great story. This is an origin story. We have here motive. We know why she's doing things. We have her history, her family's history. This is to be a part one. And if y'all stop putting it down, maybe we ain't gonna get a part two and I'm gonna be mad at all (laughs) y'all. I like this book. I thought it was good. It was all about intention. And that's so exciting. When we read that James Bond comic, I was like, man, he needs to go to therapy. Man, he really messed up. Man, what's wrong with him? And everything he was doing Uh was like secondary to me. His motivation was so sad and sorry or lacking. In this book, it's like a little bit of action. Cool. But it's more about the inner motivations of the protagonist. And I thought it was really well done. (laughs) We cannot recreate in our synopsis here the tension that she feels with Tomas. Um, the issue she has with her mother. And while you said they healed their relationship, it'll never be healed because the mother left the children and she'll never completely forgive her mother for that. Um, But they're in a quote unquote good place uh, right now. And then she's got this friend who's like down for whatever. He's like, we dated when we was kids. And you know what? Even if we never date again, I'm a ride for you. So where we got to go, let's get the ammunition. Let's call the uh, cavalry. And we. I'm ready. I'm by your side. And something about him, I really like. I do think he should probably be thinking more about his own child. Like, <laughs> I can't get myself killed for, for an a old, you know, sticky lick. But <laughs> I thought it was good. I thought it was um, points where... Parts where it could have been crass or um, overly violent, it chose not to be. So it was controlled in that way. Mm. And and that's the overall um, word that I'll use to describe Lauren Wilkinson's storytelling is very controlled. Um, and I admire that. I thought it was very subtle when her recruiter brings his boyfriend um, and Marie is like, oh, you're trying to show me a secret about you mm-hmm. only to get me to trust you. She sees through all these people and I'm with it. I I like it. Um, I know it starts with this action and people, some people wanted it to continue being action packed, but that's not a story I would have wanted to read. This is much more interesting to me and I would recommend this book. What about you, Alexis? (laughs) What's your final verdict? And would you recommend American Spy? Uh, I'm all over the place with this um, book. So I listened to it the first time and I was like, that. Snooze. You was like yes. that old boring book. Yes. <laughs> um, it was the initial action. I was like, this is gonna be great. Action packed. And yeah. then it wasn't action packed. But now hearing you say this is an origin story, I said that's an interesting take on it. Cause at the end, I definitely like where is part two? And I searched and there's no part two, like even on the way, no comments, notes or anything. Cause y'all won't shut up. <laughs> All y'all talking about is boring. <laughs> we ain't never gonna get a part two cause of y'all. Man, it's called nuance. <laughs> Ugh. 
<laughs> I saw a lot of great reviews. I, I did. I saw a lot of great reviews. Mine was about one of them. Yes, this was good. I, it just was slow for me. It was slow for me. Um, but I'm interested in a part two. I'm definitely interested in part two. I was looking for one because I feel like it would be more. I want more explanation about her sister's story. What happened with her sister? I want the story about her actually going in to get this revenge. I I think there's more that needs to be explained in the story. And maybe that's just part of part two. Again, I'm looking for part two. So what I recommend it. Yeah, sure, because behind this story is a true story. It's historical fiction. First off, um, Tomas Sankara is pretty handsome, okay? Can we just start mm-hmm. there? He's a handsome mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. I can see mm-hmm. why in the story, mm-hmm. you know, he, mm-hmm. she kind of was drawn in. I get it. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, I get it. Mm-hmm. But Logical. listen, <laughs> yeah. So I love that story. I love hearing about that story, Um so just as a whole picture all together, yeah, it was a little slow. Um, but I would, would recommend you read it, it again. I would recommend it, but I want part two. I like you. I want part two. Mm-hmm. I definitely want re- part would, two. Would you read this book again? Um, I think if I read it again, I would want the physical book in hand. I, physical book makes a big oh, difference sure. to me. Listening so audibly. So you had an e-reader. An you had e-reader. an audible book and an e-reader. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't do it for me. I think I need to be immersed in a physical copy of the book. And so I would read it again if I had a physical copy. I wouldn't listen to it again. I, I don't care for the audio portion of it. I mean, it was okay but I need a physical book. So I would recommend it. I prefer, I'm looking forward to part two, but it was a little mm-hmm. slow in parts for me. I will say, um, just to be very basic, I'm holding a book here from the library and this is the type, this is the perfect size book to me. The font is the perfect size. The spacing is perfect. And this is a book I can digest without feeling overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I understand the romance of whole, having the physical copy with the pages, especially a book like this. This makes me want to like curl up in a bathtub and just be taken away to Marie's world. Uh-huh. I'm into it. And um, the part in the beginning was the least interesting part to me. It was oh. like a relationship that starts with these grand gestures <laughs> and these big things to prove their love to you. But if you marry that person, do you want grand gestures every day? Don't you sometimes want to be like, just tell me what you're thinking. This is dumb. Why are there fireworks? You know? No, I, so, I like grand book, gestures and fireworks. So I don't uh, know. Not every day. So this book had like three grand gestures in it. Yep. And then the rest of it was true love. I felt like we was really getting to the intention, to the truth. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I but I did the first time I read it, I listened to it. I was like, there's got to be another book on the way. It's got to be because there's this is like a cliffhanger. It was like six chapters after she she and her her buddy were going to go off with guns blazing. And we don't even really know to who. Yeah. Yeah. She knows and she'll tell us if y'all stop <laughs> telling people this book is boring. It's not well, maybe boring. Maybe we'll send her a letter and be like, I feel this way about it, but I would really like to hear the rest of the story. Maybe we'll send so her we're that gonna, letter. I mean, clearly her, um, her sister's relationship with Slater, there's something dark yes. there going on that we don't have all that information. Um who the mom really is for her to say that her husband's friends are snitches. Yes. Who was the mom? Yep. Was the mom a spy? And I don't mean in a figurative sense, like literally was she part of, you know, some foreign operation? I don't she know. It says sounds that. Delicious. She says that in the book. Yeah. But I thought that was more of a metaphor, but it wasn't expounded on because um, that's, that's something for later. She just gave us enough. Very controlled. Even the flashbacks, very interesting to me. I liked going back and forth in this book. We didn't linger too long Mm-mm. on either side of time. Um, so it just gave you context and threw you right back into the present. Very good. Um, but when when her recruiter brought his partner and she saw that as a like a manipulation tool, 
to get her to tell some secrets, I was like, maybe I'm dumb because I, I just take what people give me, like what you show me. I just, but you don't do that. You, I take what people give me. You be well, like, we, what they mean we both, by we, that? we both would have been there like just <laughs> chatting up, whatever. And all the while he getting the secrets. Mm-hmm. And I would have been like us. spilling all of my beans. Like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm that an too. open book. You know, my daddy was a spy, basically. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for that well thought out synopsis. What are we reading next week, Alexis? Next week is a wild card episode and we're going to be talking about memories. That's right. Memories. Oh, I don't know if I knew that. Oh, I'm excited. All right. Well, thank you for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Honoria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us. We love y'all, too. And please go ahead and leave us a five star review also on Spotify. You can do that now. Um, If you've enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. Until next time. (laughs) Until next time, you guys. Read read something. something.